careful where you walk in the gardens of Charleston Farmhouse, lest you walk into the bust of David Garnet, known to his friends as Bunny. This represents something of extreme significance. It was carved by Tommy Tomlin, the charismatic sculptor of the Bloomsbury Group, whom Virginia Woolf described as the devastation of all hearts. And this portrays the very man who introduced him to this famous group of people. Tommy's story is one of youthful brilliance tinged with tragedy, and it begins at the commencement of last century in London. The son of a successful London barrister, Tommy was not just handsome and charming, but one of those figures, according to Bunny, of terrific calm, with whom most ordinary people frankly fell in love. In 1914, he attended Harrow School for Boys, excelling in Latin and poetry, but also experiencing the melancholic demeanor that would define his later life. He briefly studied at New College, Oxford, but as a sign of the restless character to come, he left after just two terms. During a trip to Cornwall, Tommy met the great British sculptor Frank Dobson, who became his tutor. This set him upon a trajectory to become one of the most captivating portrait sculptors of the 1920s. In this early work uh, by Tommy, you can see him channeling the influence of Frank Dobson. And on one level, it shows the, the imprint of 19th century naturalist, realist sculpture. You can, you can work out what's going on very clearly. But at the same time, there's another culture being brought to bear in a style that was then called primitivism. You see it particularly in the face, the bold lines and features, an attempt to, to create greater clarity. And you know, there's only a hop, skip and a jump from here to the radical modernism of Henry Moore in The Next Generation. Tommy's artistic abilities, combined with his seductive charm and love of intellectual discussion, beguiled the Bloomsbury Group, to whom he was introduced by Bunny at a party in 1923. Within a very short period of time, and then over the next seven years, he effectively became their sculptor in residence. Tommy immersed himself into the Bloomsbury lifestyle of uninhibited free love having affairs with Duncan Grant, Dora Carrington, Maynard Keynes, and almost too many others to be able to list. But there was one woman whom Tommy fell in love with irrevocably. Here she is, Henrietta Bingham. And you can see how her head tilts rather quirkily to the left. Apparently this was Henrietta's way of showing that she was interested in what you had to say and it's something rather poignantly that Tommy has picked up upon. Henrietta was an American socialite with whom Tommy became instantly infatuated. They started a passionate and turbulent affair, but Tommy had stronger feelings for Henrietta than she could reciprocate. She broke the heart of a man who would normally break the heart of others. After Henrietta, and Tommy broke up. He could not bear to have this image within his vicinity, and he banished it. It ended up with Dora Carrington, who was, who was also a mutual lover of both of theirs. Although the memory of Henrietta remained strongly with Tommy, it's now the arrival of Julia Strachey that adds a whole new chapter to Tommy's life. She's portrayed here by the sculptor himself. Julia, a novelist and niece of Lytton Strachey, was, like Henrietta, a woman who had been affected by a traumatic childhood. She was drawn to the parties and the bohemian lifestyle of her uncle and spent periods of time at his house, Ham Spray, where she met Tommy. Notice with Julia that, that slight tilt forward of the head that gives her a more reflective, thoughtful quality, a sort of introspective power. 
Given Tommy's massively Dionysian tendencies, it would have been a miracle had this marriage lasted. After eight years, unfortunately, she left him. Evoking their happier times, this film clip of Julia, Tommy and others dates from one of their trips to Hamspray. Tommy enjoyed making and starring in homemade movies with the amateur filmmaker Bernard Penrose. Also quite a thespian, Tommy loved to play to the camera. That last person in the clip of film was none other than Lytton Strachey, the most recognisable face of the Bloomsbury Group, in many ways one of its father figures, and also at one point a lover of Tommy's. And it was on a trip to Hamspray in the summer that the great Lytton Strachey commissioned Tommy to do a bust of him. And the magnificent result is this. This is Tommy's original plaster for a bronze that is now in the Tate Gallery. It's a work of affecting power probably his greatest. Tommy conveys Strachey's intellect and humanity with pathos and monumentality. And having captured Lytton Strachey, there was now just one other key figure that Tommy needed to immortalise, Virginia Woolf. The sitting with Tommy nearly didn't happen. She hated being peered at and disliked being in his rat-riddled, draft-ridden studio. But nonetheless, even though it was partly unfinished, a fantastically enduring image emerged. In some ways, this isn't an easy piece, reflective perhaps of the, of the unsettled nature of Virginia Woolf's mind as, as much as Tommy's by this stage as well. Nonetheless, it stands out as an enduring image of the great author. Having produced a series of wonderful sculptures throughout the middle part of his career, towards the end, he transitioned. He turned from a sculptor into a ceramicist. This wonderful piece is a fusion and it puts me in mind of Dorothy Parker's line about the Bloomsbury group living in squares, painting in circles, loving in triangles and this is a perfect triangle. It's designed by Tommy, it's painted by Duncan Grant, the ceramicist who worked with the two of them was Phyllis Keyes and they're all coming together and in that true Bloomsbury form Phyllis Keyes was in love with Duncan, Duncan had had an affair with Tommy but that was just business as usual for the Bloomsbury Group. The painting is so like the painting that you see by Duncan in some of his works from the 20s and 30s, uh, particularly those splashy strokes at the bottom. Tommy continued to create in his final years, including some impressive poetry, but his deepening reliance on drugs and alcohol finally took its toll. He died in 1937, aged 35. Tommy was a complex, conflicted character, an exuberant virtuoso, but was also prey to a depressive side. Loved by many, but also feckless. A man whose company was constantly in demand, but yet was also running from himself. Tommy's lasting legacy is that he added a whole dimension, a third dimension to the portrayal of the Bloomsbury Group. And it's through pieces like this by Tommy of Duncan Grant here at Charleston, by which we feel we know the man. He's come down to us in this form. But what I think was really remarkable about Tommy was that he didn't just capture the likenesses of this intellectually diverse and remarkable group of people. At the same time, he won their hearts. <laughs>